thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, this program, like all of our great programs, are not possible without the support of you, our community members, and all of the Friends of the Library organizations throughout Collin County. Please visit your local branch and the library's website to learn about all of the other great programs and services the library has to offer. Many of our fall offerings are starting to kind of trickle onto the website now and will continue to do so over the next month or so. So keep an eye there to register for these great upcoming programs like trivia, we have book discussions, I have an intentional aging uh, program that will be launching here in a couple of weeks as well. I would like to begin our program tonight with a land acknowledgement. The North Olympic Library System acknowledges that the lands on which we live and gather are the appropriated homelands of Indigenous peoples. We want to express our deepest respect to those peoples past and present, including the Ho Tribe, Jamestown Squallum Tribe, Lower Elwha Column Tribe, Macaw Indian Tribe, Quileute Tribe, Quinault Indian Reservation, Indian Nation, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Fort Gamble, Squallum Tribe, and the Skokomish Tribe for their these lands throughout the generations. Let us learn more about histories, cultures, and traditions of indigenous peoples. Let us strengthen relationships with sovereign tribal nations to provide an inclusive space fostering innovation and collaboration at the library. So again, welcome to everyone. And for those that have come in late, we are recording tonight. And first, um, I'd like to give a shout out to Liz, who is helping us manage the Zoom on the backside. She'll be monitoring the chat. Great place to drop your questions as we go along. And I'd like to get started with our guest presenter tonight, and that is Bonnie Roos. She's the librarian for the Jamestown Sklalem Tribal Library. And she is going to be sharing a short presentation on Coast Salish weaving with us. So I'll hand it off to Bonnie. Thank you, Cheryl. Thanks for inviting me to do this. I'm going to share my screen here. First of all, I want to say that um, I am not tribal, but I have the good fortune to be working at a tribal library. I've been there for almost eight years. Um, we are mostly closed right now for um, people to come in because we are planning a big expansion and that will be done hopefully next fall. So uh, watch for the big grand opening, you know, late fall and um, we'll, we'll be excited to welcome everybody in. Um, in the meantime, we are offering curbside services and research services. So if there's something that you'd like to check out or if there's something you'd like us to help you research, we're happy to do that. So I'd like to talk tonight a little bit about weaving. Uh, the Coast Salish folks have been weaving since time immemorial. Oops. My screen is gone. Okay, there we go. Um, so this painting is by Paul Kane in the mid 1800s. And it shows a woman re weaving on a uh, traditional Coast Salish loom. In the background, you can see another woman who is uh, spinning using a spindle and whirl. And then in the front, you see a little white dog. So George Vancouver um, was the first European to, uh, recorded European to, sail into Puget Sound in 1792. And he talked about the little wool dogs that the Coast Salish were raising. Um, he said they were numerous and they resembled those of Pomerania, though in general somewhat, somewhat larger. And they sheared them just like they shear sheep in England, but the fleece was so compact that it would, um, you could lift it up and it wouldn't separate, which is pretty amazing. Um, this description comes from uh, a rare Salish blanket article um, from the Museum of the American Indian Hay Foundation in 1926. <clears throat> so the Coast Salish people raised these little wool dogs, they called them, and they were small dogs. They were about 17 inches high, and they've now discovered that they were of the Spitz variety. They raised them in pens, or sometimes they'd raise them on islands to keep the breed pure and keep them from mixing up with the other dogs. Unfortunately, those dogs are now extinct. 
Um, this picture of this blanket is um, does have dog wool woven into it. So they would also use um, mountain goat wool or duck goose and gull down, uh, fireweed fluff, um, cattail rush, as well as cedar bark. And this blanket, this picture, this blanket, this does not have dog wool woven into it, but it does have uh, mountain goat wool. And this um, picture is of Heather Johnson Jock. She's a uh, Jamestown tribal citizen, and she's a, a master weaver, uh, very gifted. Um, this outfit that she wove was, in, the colors were inspired by the desert where she lives right now. And she won the uh, 2021 In the Spirit Native Arts Award this year. <clears throat> This basket fragment was found up on Hurricane Ridge uh, a few years ago. It's nearly 3,000 years old, and um, it provides some of the first evidence that ancient people ventured up to the mountains, which to me is kind of a no-brainer. Why wouldn't they venture into the mountains? Because the mountains are there and they're beautiful, um, but they do have proof now. And uh, interesting enough, this weave, this particular weave is still being used today. This is a great book about um, Salish basketry. It's written by Ed Carrier, who is a Suquamish elder and basket, master basket maker, and uh, Dale Crows, who's a wet site archeologist. And Ed wove a basket to uh, represent the different types of weave throughout the years. So at the bottom there, you can see at um, 45,000, 4,500 years ago, um, there was a dual wrap, dual warp wrapped um, method. 3,000 years ago, it was a wrap around plating. 2,000 years ago, it was an open twining. And 1,000 years ago, it was cross warp twining. And so those, again, those types of weave are still being used today. <clears throat> it's another great book um, from the hands of a weaver, uh, but Olympic basketry, basketry on the Olympic Peninsula. Um, and there's a lovely quote in there from Kathy Duncan, who is a Jamestown uh, Sklalem elder. And I'm just gonna read this just because it's so lovely. Um, to gather materials and weave a basket is to engage the whole body. The weaver's breath and the oil from the weaver's hands become part of each piece of material that is bent and handled during the process of pulling, stripping, cleaning, and splitting. Her materials become part of the weaver and the weaver becomes part of each basket. And this basket is um, a Coast Salish clam basket uh, collected in 1904. And open work baskets like these were made of uh, peeled cedar roots twined with split cedar strips. They were attached to woven tump lines that were used as head and shoulder straps. And they would fill these baskets with their clams and then they could run water through the basket and the sand would run out. It was a brilliant design. And this is one that was woven more recently. Unfortunately, I don't have the information about this basket, but it just shows that, you know, that weaving is still being done. And another quote from Kathy Duncan um, is about water tight baskets, which I think are amazing. Um, they were made from spruce or cedar roots and it's the most time consuming basket to make because the, the coils are sewn so tight that when water is poured in the basket, the root material swells and then the, the basket can be used for cooking. So you put water in the basket and then you place hot rocks from the fire into the water to boil it. Um, and this type of basket was also used for storage. And I just find it amazing that you can weave something that tight that it would hold water. Uh, I obviously am not a master weaver. So this is uh, an example from 1876 of a finely woven um, basket. And I suspect, I don't know for sure, but I suspect that this one was uh, watertight as well. And then this one, um, 
I find this one interesting. This was uh, woven by Kathy McGregor, who's also a Jamestown tribal elder, and she calls it a gathering basket. And the story that she told me is that, say you're going out in the woods to, and you're, you come across a berry patch that you know you didn't expect to come across, and you need a basket to gather those berries. So you just turn to the nearest cedar tree and you rip off a chunk of the bark and fold it in half and stitch it together with um, sinew or cordage or you know maybe maybe cedar root and voila you've got a basket. I, I think that's just brilliant. Um, so that's it for what I have to tell you tonight. You can learn more at the Tribal Library website. Or uh, you can go to the House of Seven Generations, our online archive and museum, and get more information. And you can always, um, you can find the information to contact us on our website. And if you have any questions, you know, after the fact here, um, please, please contact us. We're happy to help. So there's my resources that I consulted. And I would be happy to share those. And so are there any questions? Um, Bonnie, I, this is Cheryl. <laughs> um, one of the questions I have is the books that you talked about, are those items that are circulating from your library? If somebody wanted to check them out, they could yes. contact you to request them? Yes. Perfect. We do have a list of uh, books on our website that um, for, about weaving that we have available for checkout. So people can either call or they can go to the website and find that. <laughs> 